Good afternoon, everybody, and once again, welcome to what is the first um, Demo Friday webinar of this semester. Um, um, again, all part of an ongoing series of webinars we have in uh, here in this class, and you will eventually appear in the YouTube channel um, as part of the LSLP in session series. Um, and I am delighted to introduce today a, a very special a very special scholar, I mean, all around great, brilliant scholar, a uh, great teacher and a really good friend in Dr. Wayne Jornel. Um, Dr. Jornel is a full professor at the University of North Carolina, Greensboro, and one, a recognized expert in these discussions about fake news. Um, I know he recently edited a book on that topic, and I think you have another book on that. And then and there's an article that the students had the chance to read, an article that um, was published last year at the Phi Delta Kappa, and if I recall well, it's one of, it was one of the most cited articles in, mm -hmm. the, in the Kappa, which um, for people who are not familiarized with that, that is a really big deal in our field. The Phi Delta Kappa, it's, um, it's one of the most recognized journals in the world um, with a really low acceptance rate. I think it's like, what, 10% of the articles or something? Yeah, something um, like so to get A, to be published at the Kappa is a really big deal. And on top of that, to be recognized as one of the most read articles in the journal, it means um, that is a really big accomplishment. Um, so it is an honor for us to have Dr. Jornel joining us this afternoon on this topic. Um, I mean, someone I've known for several years or for many years already since we had the privilege of um, going to school together and take classes. Yeah, representing the University of Illinois <laughs> when I champagne right there. Uh, so um, I'm ex I'm ex I mean, that's also a very, an extra reason why I'm excited about um, today's webinar. So with that, without any further ado, um, I think we are, we look forward to the conversation um, for the students. Remember, if you have questions, you can, um, open your microphones, you can type the questions in the chat, I'll be monitoring both. Uh, and with that, Dr. Jornel, uh, the floor is yours. All right, uh, it's good to be here. Uh, I apologize if I say good morning, because it's 8 a.m. here, so it's not like it's afternoon where you all are. Uh, but, no, uh, actually, uh, only afternoon for me. Uh, everybody's eight in the morning. I'm the only one. Oh, every eight in the morning. Okay, because I <laughs> said afternoon. No, no. Okay, I'm the one um, who's uh, on a very different time zone. They're at the same gotcha. time. They're right now with the Eastern time. So I'm the one who's okay. uh, on the other side of the world. Again, what I want to focus on a lot on today is uh, why fake news works, and we're going to come at that from like a uh, psychosocial perspective of you know. Uh, fake news is not accidental. People put fake news out there because they know it's going to try to trick people, right? Um, so first, you know, just thinking about this from an educational standpoint, there's a lot of research out there that shows that K-12 and undergrad students have a difficult time determining um, what's real and what's not online. Um, and I'll show you a couple of examples here in, in a minute. Uh, the group that's really done a lot of research on this is the Stanford History Education Group with Sam Weinberg. Uh, you may have heard of him before, but um, I'll show you a couple of, of things from their research here in just a second. But it's, we're not talking just about K-12 and uh, undergraduates here. The, I, the, the problem of fake news is a societal problem, not just in the United States, around the world, right? Um, this, is, this is, you know, fake news, we're talking about this in a couple of slides, but Fake news is not new, right? It's been around for a long, long time, but the fact that social media has exploded now, it's made fake news you know, a bigger problem, if you will, because you know, as a society, we, we don't do a very good job of determining what's real and what's not online. Um, and uh, this is why it's so important that we try to help students early on with this type of thing. So I mentioned the Stanford History Education Group. Uh, they've done research with middle grade students, high school students, and college undergrads about um, their prop uh, propensity to uh, determine what's real and what's not online. This is an example of one of the tasks they gave middle school students. And by and large, the middle school students did not figure out which one was the most trustworthy source about Donald Trump's decision to run for president. Now, does anybody want to take a guess on which one is the most uh, trustworthy source? Wait time, see what happens. All 
Okay, so I'll, I'll do this one for you then. Um, the, uh, the, the most trustworthy one is the Facebook post A, because it's got the little things uh, of, that you, you know, if you're a consumer of social media, um, like the little blue check mark here, right? That's the actual Fox News Facebook, um, you know, site because it's got the blue check mark, the verification thing. Twitter has a, a similar type thing. Whereas this one is Fox News, the Facebook page. The problem is a lot of middle school students said that this was the most, Facebook post B was the most um, reliable source because it actually had a tweet from Donald Trump. But it didn't really have a tweet from Donald Trump because this one doesn't have the little blue check mark. So this whole thing here was fabricated. Uh, this one was the actual source, but more middle grade students uh, fell for it. Now, this is one they did with undergraduate students here in the United States. And this is a tweet, and it said, is Mason's claim about the poll accurate? And this is a tweet from somebody named Mason D. Simpson. And he links to a Gallup poll that says, the poll, and he says, the poll shows that most Americans own guns. But here's what the um, thing actually said. I'll give you a second to read it. Does anyone take, want to take a guess about why this is, uh, why Mason's tweet was misleading or actually incorrect? <clears throat> Any ideas, folks? But if I could take a guess, Wayne, I sure. think it has to do with, um, I mean, first of all, the um, the tweet itself is clickbait, that like most Americans own guns, and then um, say 60% of Americans, it, without without showing the actual sample, that is, that's where it really gets misleading. Yeah, because it says that 60% of Americans own guns in order to feel safe. That doesn't mean 60% of Americans own guns. Basically, what the, the poll said was of the Americans who own guns, 60% of those folks um, own guns to, to feel safe. So the tweet, you know, whether Mason meant it or not, he had a, a bad read of what this article was about. And the problem is uh, the undergraduates that they gave this uh, task to, most of them you know, could not click on the link and read this just like we did and come up with the, the understanding that Mason was wrong on this. So this just gives you an idea of how pervasive fake news is and how easy it is for, you know, uh, middle grade students, high school students, and even, you know, college undergrads uh, to fall victim to this type of, of misinformation. So let's kind of step back and actually talk about what fake news is, because, you know, we've heard this term, especially since, you know, Donald Trump ran for president of the United States and he called everything fake news, you know, and uh, and it kind of became a, a talking point for him. Right. Um, like I said, fake news is not new. It didn't start with Donald Trump. Donald Trump did not come up with fake news. The idea of lying or misrepresenting uh, information for political advantage um, has been going on for centuries right? It, it, it's just not new. It just seems new because we're all in a social media environment and, you know, everything is coming at us 24-7 and there's a lot of more opportunities to engage in this type of fake news practice. Um, that said, Donald Trump has brought the term fake news uh, into, you know, uh, society much more since he was president of the United States. Um, but again, there's no clear definition of what it means. And so what I want to do here for a few minutes is kind of break down what, what I mean by actual fake news and then Trump's version of fake news. And I'll give you a little spoiler here. The reason why it's so hard to make a difference between the two is both of them work for the same reason. And that's, and that's the interesting part. So let's talk about the actual fake news first. And when I talk about actual fake news, I'm talking about stuff that is factually incorrect, right? That you can verifiably look at it and say, that is just wrong, right? But it gets passed off as uh, legitimate information, especially for people who aren't, um, you know, well-versed in politics or keeping up with current events. 
Now, there's also a sliding scale on what is actual fake news. So um, here in the United States, we have a lot of satire sites, and you may have uh, different types of, of satire sites in, in your country as well. Um, but these, these uh, things are uh, like the Onion and the Babylon Bee and, and then like Saturday Night Live weekend updates, even things like The Daily Show or um, Last Week Tonight with John Oliver, which those are two shows that I love. They, they are comedy shows. They are meant to be, you know, uh, tongue in cheek and satire. And if you look at like The Onion and the Babylon Bee's website, especially the Babylon Bee, they, they actually say this is fake news. This is stuff that, you know, is, is not accurate. Now, The Onion doesn't actually say it. And I'm sure you've probably seen people who have unwittingly uh, shared information on Facebook or Twitter from like a site like The Onion, right? So you have to actually be in on the joke to understand that it's fake news. But again, this is incorrect information, but they're at least open about it. When most people think about fake news, they think about things that um, are verifiably false, that you know, are trying to persuade people to think that it's true. So the perfect example of this is the Russian attempts to influence um, the American election back in 2016. Um, the Russians, uh, you know, we, we know for a fact, uh, this is a perfect example. This is actually one of the things that a Russian um, you know, operative uh, put into Facebook uh, and or Twitter um, back in 2016 to try to get people to vote for Donald Trump or dissuade people from voting for Hillary Clinton. And so this uh, thing here is a photoshopped image of a famous actor. I'll be honest, I can't remember his name right now, but he's a, he's a famous actor here in the United States. And it says that um, you don't have to go to the polls. You can just tweet your vote uh, by using the hashtag presidential election. Now, I can tell you with all certainty that you can, you cannot tweet your votes in the United States. You actually have to go either cast an absentee ballot or go to the polls. And so this was, you know, most, I would like to think that most people saw this and realized that it wasn't legitimate, right? Um, but, uh, you know, the, uh, I, I'm not sure that, you know, the people who fell for this, we'd want them to vote anyway. But more, um, more, uh, a, a better example of this kind of like manipulative fake news. This is another one of that they, they found that was a Russian operative during the 2016 uh, election. And so this is a um, post from, you know, a group called the Heart of Texas. Now, if you know anything about Texas in the United States, it's pretty conservative. And look at what it says here. Hillary Clinton has a 69% disapproval rate among all veterans. Indeed, there are many reasons for it. First of all, Benghazi. And that was a situation that happened when she was Secretary of State. Four people died on her watch and she did not send help. Secondly, Hillary refused to apologize to all veterans when she made several remarks about veterans embellishing the situation at the VA. Finally, Hillary is, the only, is only one politician except Barack Obama who's despised by the overwhelming majority of American veterans. If Hillary becomes President of the United States, the American army should be withdrawn from Hillary's control according to the amendments in the Constitution. The hard part about this um, this Facebook post is not all of it is completely false. So if you break it down sentence by sentence here, Hillary Clinton has a 69% disapproval rate among all veterans. Now they didn't provide any citations. You know, Russian trolls don't, you know, uh, usually provide citations, right? But um, there was actually some polling data from a uh, military times that, you know, uh, polled uh, military veterans in the United States. And it was pretty much in the ballpark. They did, they did not like uh, Hillary Clinton all that much, right? Um, then there was the situation in Benghazi. That was an actual a thing. And then the thing about Hillary refusing to apologize to all veterans, she did make a statement on the Rachel Maddow show back, you know, before she, even before she was Secretary of State, I think. And it got a lot of people, including then John McCain, to speak out against it. So up to this point, everything there was pretty much, you know, kind of, on, on target. It's the last sentence that is completely false. If Hillary becomes president of the United States, the American army should be withdrawn from Hillary's control according to the amendments to the Constitution. There is no amendment to the Constitution that says that, you know, the president, uh, the army can be withdrawn from the president's control. Now, what I want you, I think, is the most important thing to look at here is um, the right below the, uh, the Facebook post. Look how many times it got shared, 300, over 300 times um, it got shared. So 
even though this is false information, people kind of see it, they agree with it, whether they know it's false or not, and then they share it. And then presumably other people share it and other people share it. And you can kind of see how this fake news just kind of blows up. In fact, the research shows that incorrect information spreads faster on social media than accurate information. And we'll talk about why that is in just a minute. This is another one. Uh, this is just a kind of a, let me show that it's <laughs> not just uh, conservatives here in the United States that peddle fake news. Uh, you may remember that Donald Trump instituted a policy of separating children at the border during his uh, administration. And this, this uh, post came from a, uh, I think a Facebook post called uh, Bernie Sanders, Millennial, Millennials for Bernie Sanders, who was, a, who was a liberal politician in the United States. And it says, no, this isn't a prison. This is a kid's concentration camp in the United States. The issue is this photo um, actually came from an article describing policies that were under the uh, presidency of Barack Obama. So again, uh, the sentiment behind the, the post isn't necessarily false, but the, the images that they used were not about the Trump, uh, the, the Trump uh, separation uh, actions at the border. Then you ha actually have organizations that, you know, peddle conspiracy theories. Here's probably the most famous one here in the United States, InfoWars. And basically, InfoWars is a conspiracy organization founded by this guy here, Alex Jones. And this is pretty much what he does on his shows all the time. Uh, he just pounds the desk and screams at things that are nonsense. And you can see some of the, uh, some of the crazy stuff that they have peddled on InfoWars. But, you know, you might sit there and think, well, why would anybody pay attention to this guy? You know, he's obviously crazy. Well, he is crazy, but his audience reaches, you know, two, three million people. Um, all right. Um, now, uh, the other, this real scary part is sometimes that politicians actually peddle inaccurate information on purpose. Um, if you remember that Donald Trump got impeached the first time, he actually got impeached twice, but he got impeached the first time uh, for, um, you know, issues um, with uh, in, inappropriate conduct that led to the Mueller report. And um, on the left side of the screen, this is the actual text from both the Mueller report and the text that summarized the Mueller report from his own attorney general. And notice it says, while this report does not conclude that the president committed a crime, it also does not exonerate him. Well, look what Donald Trump tweeted. No collusion, no obstruction, total exoneration. I mean, that's just completely you know, inaccurate of what the Mueller report said. And of course, then you've got Fox News, which is the conservative uh, news outlet here in the United States. They say the exact same thing. This is a, a, a picture from Lou Dobbs show at that time, where it says vindicated and exonerated. So this is, you know, inaccurate, you know, verifiably inaccurate information. But if people don't go make a, a point to go find the actual information, they just believe what they see on television and, and on Twitter, right? This is another one. Um, this is a, a um, conservative a Republican congressman here in the, uh, the United States. And he tweeted a uh, photo that says, the world is a better place without these guys in power. And that's uh, former President Barack Obama and a photoshopped image, image of the uh, uh, president of Iran. Um, you know, this was, I think, uh, a photo of Obama with the president of India, but they photoshopped it to show the president of Iran. And then you have a, uh, an actual congressman, a sitting congressman retweeting, right? So, um, you know, problematic, definitely. So that's, you know, we've talked about at this point, actual fake news, fake news that is, that is legitimately false, that if re somebody really wanted to, you know, do the digging, they could come up with the, you know, the, the real information. Now, the problem is they don't always want to do the digging, and we'll come back to that in just a minute. But I do think it's important to also talk about what Trump's version of fake news is, because whether you like Donald Trump or not, um, one thing you have to concede about Donald Trump is that he was masterful in using fit the term fake news as a weapon. And during his run to the presidency and during his uh, time in office, he used the term fake news all the time to uh, delegitimize the actual mainstream media, the, the, the press that was actually putting out accurate information. And basically he used fake news to say that anything that was, you know, against him was automatically just fake. 
And what he was doing there is he was completing bias with accuracy. And this is an important thing to understand when we're talking about fake news. Something can be biased, but it still can be accurate, right? Bias in itself isn't necessarily bad. Everything's biased, right? Um, every newspaper you read, every you know, news channel you see, everything you see on social media is going to be biased in some way because human beings are innately biased, right? We, we all have our own prejudices and, and beliefs and, and things like that, right? That just, that's who we are. Just because something's biased, though, doesn't mean it's, that it's false. And so you probably have seen images like this floating around social media. Uh, the one on the left was something created by someone who leans more liberal. The one on the uh, right is by somebody that leans more conservative. Now, you can see the difference here in these two graphs when we talk about bias. So in the one on the liberal side, the one on the left, here they've got, you know, in the middle with, they have like things like NPR and CBS News and the AP and, you know, stuff that in the United States we consider mainstream media. They have that right here in the middle, the neutral part here. Whereas the person on the conservative side, they have it more leaning to the liberal side. And that's the way most conservatives kind of feel that like, our mainstream media here in the United States, it does lean a little bit to the, to the left, right? Um, but for the purposes of, of our discussion today, I'm not worried about where they, put, where they put it as far as on this axis here, because what both uh, charts both agree upon is whether they say it, whether it leans left or it's neutral, they both say that these types of, of outlets are high quality, that they are producing accurate information. But notice down at the bottom um, right-hand side here, um, I don't know if you can see it down here, I moved. they've got InfoWars, the one that I had um, up before, both of them, whether it's conservative or liberal, they have it down in the bottom right-hand corner to show that it's just garbage you know, information. You shouldn't believe anything that's on, on InfoWars. And so that's what we want to try to get at, um, whether you are liberal or conservative, is that we can agree upon what sources actually have accurate information versus inaccurate information. Um, and bias, we, we don't worry about as much. Now, like I said, here's the kicker. Actual fake news and Trump's version of fake news work for the same reasons. Um, psychosocial factors, which is what I'm going to uh, you know, kind of focus on to, today. But also, one of the things that we've kind of created a perfect storm, um, not just here in the United States, but I think around the world as well. We are more polarized now than you know we've been in recent recent times, um, you know, uh, and social media kind of plays a part in this because it allows us to self-select into echo chambers. Now I'm not going to make you call yourselves out here, but how many people even think about this internally? How many of you have ever blocked somebody on social media because you disagreed with their political beliefs? Right? I would imagine most of us probably have. Uh, because you get tired of seeing their posts that you just disagree with. Well, the problem is if you do that uh, too much, you end up kind of putting yourself in an echo chamber where you're only seeing your own um, your own side of things. Okay, um, which which is is problematic because it it reinforces these psychosocial issues. So I want to talk about a couple of psychosocial. Th th this comes from um, research in political science and communication studies. This idea of motivated reasoning and confirmation bias. What basically these terms mean is that when we as people, and I say we, I'm talking about me, you, everybody, we have a propensity to find new information. And when we find that new information, we automatically try to incorporate that into what we already believe. <clears throat> I always like to tell people, you know, we live, especially here in the United States, we live in a, a time where we should be the most informed people on the planet because we have all sorts of news stations all over the place. I mean, 70 years ago, there was really one news outlet in the United States. It was the CBS Evening News. Walter Cronkite was the one who told everybody the way it was. Um, now you should be able to kind of you know, get a lot of information and come up with a, a, a big picture. The problem is most people don't do that. Most people find the side that they already believe in, just watch that. And instead of watching the news or 
to, to kind of go, huh, I want to learn more about that. They watch it to go, darn right. You know, this is what, you know, I already believe. And that's, that's an example of motivated reasoning and confirmation bias. And we see it played out all the time on social media. Um, and, I, and, and before we get into this, I want to make sure we understand this is part of the human condition. Just because uh, you fall into this trap, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to call myself out on it here in a few slides, um, it it's doesn't mean you are a bad person or you've done something wrong. It's that, you know, this is just one of those things that, you know, we are as human. Humans like to think there's a, that, that we're right. You know, we, it's hard to look at something and admit that we had it wrong. Um, and that's one of the reasons why fake news is so hard to uh, get people to, to break away from their pre-existing worldviews. This uh, image was shared all over social media while Donald Trump was running for president. And you may have seen it as well. And of course, it says, if I were to run, I'd run as a Republican. They're the dumbest group of voters in the country. They believe anything on Fox News. I could lie and they'd still eat it up. I bet my numbers would be terrific. And it says he said this to People Magazine in 1998. This is actually a pretty easy one um, to, you know, debunk. He never said it. He never said it to People Magazine. He never said it to, to our knowledge. Um, he's never said it, at least out loud, to anyone. You know, uh, he never said anything similar. So the question is, why did so many people, including people I know, <coughs> who I consider smart people, why did they share this so much on social media? And the answer is, is because it seems like something Donald Trump would say. It seems like something that liberals would, would expect Donald Trump to say, because, you know, liberals in 2016 were trying to, and I, I'm saying this as myself, um, is we were trying to come up with any sort of reason why people would vote for Donald Trump for president, because I, I you know, I'll speak for myself. <clears throat> I really just didn't understand how this person who had no political experience, who came out and said just obvious things that didn't make any sense, like Mexico was going to pay for a border wall and things like that, how anybody would vote for him. And so it kind of fits that narrative that liberals had in 2016. <clears throat> but it was, was incorrect. Now, the, the funny part was, when I saw some of my liberal friends who would post this, and either I or somebody else would kind of come along and post the, the fact checkers that said, no, Donald Trump didn't actually say that. They would write something back that said, well, even if he didn't say, it, you know, it's true, which leads to another psychosocial fact, factor, which is kind of really scary for um, education, right? Um, it's called the backfire effect. And, and for you know, a certain number of people, and they, the, the research kind of goes back and forth on how many people fall into this trap, is that even when you show them factual evidence <clears throat> that, that you know, contradicts what they actually believe, it makes those prior beliefs stronger. So when you think about ourselves as educators, you know, because you know, with fake news, a lot of times people say, well, just teach them the facts. Well, that's not always going to work um, because for some students, they're just going to you know, dig in even harder. So let's talk, give a couple more examples of this um, psychosocial issue. So this is another uh, one of the uh, Russian bots here that was in 2016. And it's coming from, again, from that group of Heart of Texas. And let's look at what they say here. Border Patrol agents in South Texas arrested an illegal alien from Honduras that had previously been deported and convicted of rape second degree. Thanks to Obama and Hillary's policy, illegals come here because they, they wait for amnesty promise. The wrong course has been chosen by the American government, but all those politicians are too far from the border to see who actually sneaks through illegally. Rapists, drug dealers, human traffickers, and others. <clears throat> the percent of illegal poor families searching for a better life is too small to become an argument for amnesty and Texas warm welcome. Now, the thing is, again, Russians do not, you know, cite their sources, you know, the ones that are trying to influence elections. Is there anything necessarily... 100% factually inaccurate from that post. And I would argue probably not. Now, again, they didn't cite anything, but is it out of the realm of possibility that someone who crossed the border illegally um, committed a crime, you know, something like rape? It's not out of, the, out of, you know, the realm of possibility. What they get down to, where it plays into the psychosocial factors is when they talk about the percent of innocent poor families searching for a better life is too small to become an argument for amnesty in Texas warm welcome. Well, that is very ambiguous. For some people, they would argue that 
you know, even if 99% of people who come across the border are you know, law abiding citizens, that 1% is too much, right? Um, but, you know, and it kind of sounds like this, doesn't it? If you remember Donald Trump's, um, you know, start of his campaign, this is from the day he announced his campaign. And when he says stuff like this, right, it kind of plays into people's pre existing fears and things like that. So that's why these type of, of you know, posts work. Again, look at the bottom here. It got shared over a thousand times, right? And it's just bouncing around these echo chambers on social media because it's, you know, people who are reading this and agreeing with it, they already believe it. And so when they share it, they're just sharing it to people who already believe this stuff and just kind of bouncing back and forth, which gets back to the, you know, if you think about what the Russians were trying to do in 2016, they weren't trying to necessarily make people dislike Hillary Clinton. They were trying to get people, you know, worked up to go out to the polls to vote for Donald Trump, right? And that's what these kind of posts were doing. Here's another post that really plays into psychosocial factors. Um, and this is from Donald Trump Jr., Donald Trump's son. And it says, this image says it all. Let's end the politically correct agenda that doesn't put America first. And he says, if I had a bowl of Skittles and I told you just three would kill you, would you take a handful? And he compares that to, at least at that time, the question, of whether we should let in Syrian refugees at that time. Well, again, is there anything 100% false on this? And I would argue no, but it's very misleading and it plays into people's fears about Syrian refugees. Um, the problem is, is if you take that bowl right there and, and you know maybe there's, maybe there's, I don't know, 50 Skittles in that bowl and three of them were poison, would any of us grab a handful and take our chances? No, I don't think we would. But if you look at the research to show that um, of refugees, Syrian or otherwise, that come into the United States, the number that commit violent crimes or anything like that, terrorism or anything like that, is extremely small. You have a better chance of getting struck by lightning. So if this was, um, to be accurate, the uh, the size of the Skittle Bowl would need to be about the size of an Olympic swimming pool. And so then if I were to come to you and say, okay, we've got an Olympic swimming pool full of Skittles, three of them are poisonous, but if you take a handful and eat them, I'll give you $10 million. I think most of us would take that bet, right? At least I would. <laughs> I'll take that bet because the odds are, you know, are minuscule that you would get something that would hurt you. Now, I told you I was going to call myself out here. So this is, a, this is my Facebook post from several years ago. And you may not know this story, so I'll, I'll preface it for you. So there was a group of high school students who supported Donald Trump. You can see their red hats. They were wearing the red, you know, Make America Great hats. And they were up protesting. I think it was a pro-life rally in uh, Washington, D.C. <clears throat> At the same time, uh, there was an indigenous um, uh, rights protests going on at the same time in Washington, D.C. And these two groups kind of clashed. And I remember I was in a I was at a conference in uh, Miami, Florida. And so I, I was busy. And, you know, normally I try to you know check the sources that I you know post on so social media. But I got this video of this kid here um, smirking right in the face of this indigenous uh, uh, protester. And, you know, I just kind of had this you know, visceral reaction, and I, I kind of snapped, and I just, I posted it, and I posted this post here that, you know, um, and I was blaming all the stuff on the, the Trump supporters, because it fit into what I kind of already believed about Trump and Trump supporters, right, that they, you know, they had, a lot of them were, as Hillary Clinton would call them, deplorables, who were racist and sexist, and you know, go on down the list, right? Um, well, if, if you know that story, uh, the next day, a longer video came out that showed that the indigenous protester here actually came up to the students and started antagonizing them first. Um, so, you know, it, it created a much more complex situation. And so it was interesting after I posted this and then the longer video came out, um, the, my friends on Facebook were, you know, I, I'm not showing them out of their privacy, but they they were posting back and forth and, you know, people who supported Donald Trump came in with the longer video and said, well, you know, you're wrong. And, and you know, 
And then you saw this backfire effect that we talked about earlier. My friends, including maybe myself, I can't remember, um, were saying, well, even though the guy came up to him first, you know, they're still right. You know, the point is it kind of became one of those like there's a perfect example of how, you know, the way we are entrenched in our own beliefs plays out on social media, whether the regardless of what the facts are. And it turns out the uh, the kid there, his name was Nick Sandman. Um, he he got paid by CNN and other places because people like me jumped to a uh, conclusion without getting the whole story. So um, again, I, I post that because I want everybody to know it happens to the best of us. I mean, I'm a trained social scientist <laughs> and I do this for a living and, and you know, I, I still screw up every once in a while. So um, it's just, it, it happens. And again, it, it doesn't mean we're necessarily bad people. It means we're human. And it's always been a part of the human commitment condition. Um, so you might be sitting there going, well, what can we do, you know, as, as teachers, you know, with, when we're dealing with our students? The, the thing that's difficult and why I wanted to focus on this psychosocial issue is there's limited amount of things we can do for the students who do not want to find accurate information on, who, who know that they are actively peddling false information. Because there are people out there, right? You know, they, they you know, here in the United States, you know, the people on Fox News, like Sean Hannity and, and uh, Tucker Carlson, we, we know from the, the information that's come out on the January 6th uh, insurrection at the Capitol, that they knew it was something bad. I mean, they were texting Donald Trump and his family, but yet on the air that night, they were talking about how it wasn't that big of a deal. So, you know, when you have people who knowingly peddle uh, fake news, you know, that's a, that's a moral decision. What I think we should focus on here in, uh, when we deal with students is we want to assume that they want to find accurate information online and how can we help them do that? So the research has um, some interesting uh, things that we can do. This again comes from the Stanford History Education Group. And um, I'll send uh, uh, Dr. Mora a uh, video that he can share with you. I didn't know if it would work on, on the Zoom. But it's a great video that kind of shows how this works, but I'll kind of explain it here right now. Uh, the, what the Stanford History Education Group basically did is they took a, a historian, uh, someone who has a PhD in history, so a smart person, and then they took professional fact checkers, the people who work at Snopes and, and you know, the other people who, who um, you know, vet uh, claims online, and they gave them a task. And I think the task was something along the lines of this, even this was even pre-pandemic, but talking about this, there was this dubious claim by um, this fringe group of pediatricians talking about how vaccines were bad for kids, you know, something along those lines. But the bigger point was they said, all right, I want you to tell me if this claim is legitimate. The PhD historian <coughs> took the claim and the website it came from as a, as, a, as a one document. And they looked at it based on how we used to do media literacy back probably when you all went to school, uh, looking at the author, was it legitimate? Looking at you know, the, the, the website, did it look like a, a, a polished website? Um, you know, and just going down the information, did it make sense? Whereas, and, and the professional historian missed it. They got it wrong. They said it was a legitimate claim. Uh, the professional fact checkers, it was amazing. Within 30 seconds of going to the original website, they left and opened up new browsers on their windows. And so what they did is they went from, you know, this unknown source to sources that they had, you know, figured out that, you know, five or six sources that they knew produced legitimate information. And so like going back to those, those two graphs that I showed you a few slides ago, one thing that I always try to tell students is, you know, you can't memorize every single news outlet out there and see whether it's a good one or there's just too many of them. Plus a lot of the things that we get on social media don't have like an author, like, you know, a meme doesn't have an author. Um, but, you know, I try to find three or four legitimate you know, pieces of information um, from both liberal and conservative point of view. So like here in the United States, I use like the New York Times, Washington Post on the liberal side, um, the uh, Wall, Wall Street Journal on the conservative side. So, open up new browser windows. And if I can't find this claim on the you know, legitimate sites, it automatically raises a red flag about whether the uh, information was legitimate. 
Here's the, here's the thing, though. It sounds like it was more work to do that, but the fact checkers did it quicker than the PhD historian. So the PhD historian just evaluating this one source took longer and they didn't get it right. The, uh, the people from Scopes, uh, Snopes, they were able to get it accurate, get it right, and they did it in, in you know, a quarter of the time. And so, you know, being able to show students how to read laterally across, you know, with open browser windows, rather than just focusing on one document is a great way to get at um, media literacy and help them combat fake news. And then to kind of try to help them understand how this directed motivation and confirmation bias, these psychosocial factors we've been talking about, how they play a part in it. So some strategies here that you can use with students. Show your work, right? Um, don't assume that students know how to do this. When I work, even with my work with pre-service teachers and undergrads now, when I'm trying to vet a claim in class, I, I show them the process of lateral uh, reading, right? Showing their work. Um, and then have them compare stories with outlets and with different ideologies. This gets to, them to understand not necessarily accurate versus inaccurate, but bias. You know, if you've got one story, you know, a new, a current event issue, how is it being depicted on a conservative website? How is it being uh, depicted on a, a liberal website? Um, you know, a good example here is if you take screenshots of Fox News and MSNBC or CNN here in the United States, they might both talk about a story, but uh, like, let's say it's a story against Joe Biden that's negative against Joe Biden. Fox News is going to have it first on the top of their list. CNN might have it at the bottom of their list and vice versa, right? Um, you know, have students create memes and test them out on their own social media networks. They're all on social media, whether it's TikTok or, you know, they're not on Facebook anymore. That's the old people thing, but TikTok or um, Twitter or whatnot. Um, have them create, you know, uh, memes um, and figure out, you know, what kind of information gets the most attention. And I can go ahead and tell you, research shows that inaccurate information gets shared more, negative things get shared more versus positive things. And again, I think that goes back to what just the, it's the human condition. So that was a quick and dirty uh, uh, discussion of fake news. Um, I'm happy to answer, you know, ask, answer any questions that you have, or you can send me an email, or you can check out the work that I've done with uh, this stuff on the website. Well, first of all, Wayne, um, thank you so much for all the um, all the information that you shared with us today. Because, um, and I think it's, I mean, there are some particular things there that I think are worth highlighting. And the first one is um, understanding that fake news is not um, simply a fabrication of, let's say, of right wing uh, mm. organizations. That um, fake news happen across the board. Yeah. Um, Second, that it's important to also recognize the, 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 the idea of bias. So I think the idea of bias is, is very important there because we all have biases. I mean, we don't, we talk always have talked about this in research that we all come with biases um, and we all come with stereotypes. It's just how we kind of grow past the bias and we kind of grow past the stereotypes, what helps us become more informed. But I think it's yeah. important to also recognize our biases. Well, and the fact that bias does not always equal inaccurate information. Mm -hmm. And that's what that's what Donald Trump was masterful in, in getting his his supporters to believe that anything that was that was negative to him automatically was just fake. And that wasn't the case. Mm -hmm. um, and so when you conflate those two things, that's a problem. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, it's, and it's interesting because even the term when you think about the term fake news, mm -hmm. um, the term fake news. Um, has already become or has kind of picked up a life of its own. I mean, even in Spanish, we don't have, we, I mean, I've seen people using the word, the term fake news mm -hmm. to refer to yeah. that. So they actually mm -hmm. say fake news. So yeah, even the term itself has picked up a life of its own that in other languages, and I, again, I, I haven't traced other languages, but I'm pretty sure it's similar. It's, it happens across the board. It's, a, it's already become not just fake news, but fake news is a is kind of it's, a, it's already a concept. It's it's a it's it's a concept of its own. Mm -hmm. Yeah, definitely. So um, at this point, I 
I'm going to ask the uh, students in the class if they have any questions. I mean, again, you're welcome to um, either type your questions in the type your questions in the chat or just open your microphone and um, I mean folks in the audience and of course Atiana, the other professor who accompanies the class, if you have questions or anything you want to add to the conversation, um, this is a really good time to do it. So let's give everybody a couple of minutes to think, turn off the microphones. Again, I imagine you probably, I mean, at this point, probably processing information because there's a, there's yeah. a lot of that. I mean, there's a lot of information right there. But while while the students got, and again, just, again, at some point, raise your hand or just open the microphone <coughs> and, and fire away. Um, I really like the, I mean, I really like the the way you kind of talk. And, um, so um, Tatiana says she's fixing her microphone, so we're going to give her a couple of seconds. Um I really like the, because uh, I've seen that bias chart that you showed. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's, um, and it's a very famous bias chart they have in this. I mean, I don't haven't seen an equivalent like that in Colombia. I would be restricted if at some point some journalism students or media study students would um, start doing something like that for us because we do have, I mean, even off the top of my head, I could just start putting things, I could start right. pinpointing things mm -hmm. um, from our local websites in different ends of that of that, what, what amounts to a bell curve. Um, but I, th I think it's important to recognize <coughs> that, that, and again, one that on the one hand, the difference between accuracy and let's say partisanship uh, is to call it something, right. that they're not necessarily the same thing. There is not a correlation that hyper-partisan sites lean to the left or are more inaccurate, but no, that because um, I follow a few of those. For example, I follow alternate in alternate Although it's one of those that people really put on the on the far left, mm -hmm. <laughs> on the middle to far left, um, and I follow them. Sometimes I read the articles, and yeah, once you once you analyze the articles, um, then there is another one. It's Occupy Democrats. That's like that's probably yeah. the worst. Yeah, it is. <laughs> I mean, yeah. it's like because I mean I've been following the uh, Occupy Democrats for I started following them sometime around 2015 when mm -hmm. the election. And, Every every week they were announcing that oh this is the, they were putting like this shock <laughs> announcement yeah. that oh now like Trump is toast yeah and every yeah. week is like okay but and nothing <laughs> happens <laughs> and yeah. so it's that even in that sense the exaggeration but Tatiana the cat the is on the cam um, turn your camera on I think she's ready so Tatiana right. you um whenever you're ready can you hear me. Yeah, we yeah. can hear you. Okay, okay. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Professor Jornel, well, uh, first of all, I would like to thank you for this uh, presentation and explaining to students because um, something that actually is happening this semester is that Raul and I, we shared this same group with different topics. Mm -hmm. Yes. And actually yesterday uh, in the topic I'm teaching is um, actually about critical discourse analysis. Uh, we invited a journalist. Uh, <coughs> to explain us a little bit how um, news are created, right? Mm -hmm. And how clickbaits are um, thought, uh, th thought in, um, yes, for, for, for people actually to click <laughs> and, yeah. to read, mm -hmm. and to read whatever news they're clicking in, right? <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah, the titles um, especially. Yes, yeah, the titles, yeah, exactly. <clears throat> and it's um, quite interesting how uh, you are presenting uh, how fake news um, can change the perspective and actually drives people to, of course, take decisions or think our reality and our perspective. So I think it's very interesting for our students to have this opportunity to see actually the other way than, than how actually these thing, the, the, the topic of fake news work uh, in social media, because yesterday uh, we just saw how um, titles are thought, how linguistically uh, journalists think how to um, change perspective and how uh, to sell, basically, and how actually the the ones who are um, I, I, I forgot the name the the. the El comité, el comité editorial de yeah, the editorial board. Thank you. The editorial board uh, decides what goes in in a newspaper and what what doesn't go, just because of who's in the power. 
right? So thank you a lot for everything. Yes, yeah, so that's, a, that's a great point. I mean, anytime you see something online that's news related, there, you should always ask yourself, who benefits from this, right? Because there's, there's always a benefit with, you know, with news organizations. It's all about money. I mean, everything's about money, right? You know, and that's why they have the clickbait, you know, titles because they want people to click. They get a certain amount of money for every view, download and everything like that. Um, you know, and if it's a meme or something, it's probably because somebody wants to change people's opinion. Right. There's there's all people don't put stuff out there just because. Right. I mean, we even do that. Like when we post pictures of our kids or our pets. Right. We're posting that because we want to make, make people feel good or click our, you know, like things and stuff like that. So there's, there's always a, uh, a benefit, you know, uh, so it's always a good thing to, to ask when you look at news stuff, right? Yeah, and, you, and when you start talking about the clickbait, I, I think it's important because uh, just as you mentioned the example of um, the example of the news story about the, um, the MAGA, the kid with the MAGA hat and the indigenous um, protester, that sometimes it's really easy to take um, video clips out of context and use them for, for multiple reasons. I remember several years ago, there was a controversy or my controversy but several years ago, um, there was this series of videos depicting at the time, the president of Ecuador, Rafael Correa, um, Rafael Correa, the president of Ecuador, supposedly giving, I mean, he was giving a talk at Yale University and they spliced the videos to make him sound like he was completely inarticulate, like, uh, like he couldn't speak a lick of English. So it was interesting because people were passing him, people were mocking him. And I, and, and I, and I decided, well, let me just trace back again, not without the political intention, because um, I mean, I don't necessarily approve. I mean, yeah, I wasn't going to be partisan in this one, but I was like, okay, let me just trace back I, again, with knowing the fact that um, President Correa, he, he did his PhD in economics at, at Illinois. So it's like, okay, someone who did a PhD in economics uh, can be some, has to be someone who yeah. has a good command of the language. I mean, I know the people who do PhDs in economics at the, our university. And I went back and I listened to the, to the entire speech. It was like an hour and a half. And you're like, okay, the speech, I mean, sure, he does speak with a half, with a, with a, Ecuadorian accent because he's from Ecuador, mm. but like when you listen to the entire thing, it was actually it was quite fluent. But when they started splicing, they were kind of um, what they did. Basically, it's gonna if you start kind of taking someone and you start just doing the um, um mm. just cut, you just splice a video of somebody just saying um you know for half an hour. Yeah, um, we all no look matter, stupid. Yeah. yeah, exactly. No matter who you put there. Yeah. I mean. You can take you can take a, you can take Morgan Freeman or James Earl Jones, yeah. and if you all you record is when they're saying um and you know they're gonna sound horrible. Even yeah, again, we're talking about Morgan Freeman and James Earl Jones. You can what? if you splice the video at the wrong moments, you can make him sound entirely inarticulate. Well, you also bring up a good point that you know, and I think it's important for everybody to know that this this issue of fake news is only going to get worse as the technology gets better. I mean, we're we're already seeing things called deep fakes, where that I mean, it and it makes it look like somebody like Barack Obama or Donald Trump or whoever is actually saying the, you know, it, it's it it's a doctored video, but the technology is so good that you can't tell that the big video is doctored, so you can't even trust what your eyes see anymore. I mean, it's 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 it, and I think the technology is going to continue to get better, and we're going to see mm. more of this deep fake type of things. So, yeah, so obviously that brings the question, how do we counter that? How, how do we continue? I mean, since technology is always moving so fast, so at such a high speed, how, how do we counter that? I still think the, um, the, the, the lateral reading that the Stanford History Education Group, because uh, that's, you know, a deep fake video, um, that's one thing, but, you know, you can't deep fake the, uh, the printed word, right? So there, mm -hmm. there's always the printed word you can go back to. So being able to look at that video, and if it just doesn't seem right, it's like, don't take it on face value. I think that's the biggest thing with fake news is you can't take things you see online at, at face value. You've got to do a little digging. And, you know, and the thing I like to try to really hammer home is doing that digging doesn't take much effort. It doesn't take much time. It's actually quicker than trying to 
you know, work through, you know, was this video doctored or whatever? Just go look, you know, because if they, if, because think of it this way. If you got a video of Joe Biden saying, you know, I hate women. Let's say, you know, the, there's a deep fake video that says, but Joe Biden comes out and says, I hate women. That's newsworthy, right? So, you know, I guarantee you within 10 seconds of a Google search, you would find reputable uh, news sources that would be reporting on that. If you can't find news sources that are reporting on that, then it probably means the video is doctored. Right. You know, I mean, mm -hmm. you know, a little bit of common sense sometimes. too. Yeah. Yeah. And it's interesting because, um, yeah, I was I just got a text message from um, from my my my, my, my I mean, Paulina's on the other side because we're in the same. We're, and she's something about kind of going back to that part um, about the onion. And then what's the benefit? What kind of what would be the, what's the benefit of characterizing the onion as fake news? Like, why? Why do we have to really make it clear that? And, and then because there is um. There is a particular website it's called Actualidad Panamericana, which is basically the Onion. But and it, just like the Onion, we have had politicians retweeting stories from that, and people are like, "Yeah, but you do realize um, that's the Onion." And kind of like, "Why are you retweeting the Onion?" Although sometimes the Onion is too close to reality that it's kind of it's, it's kind of creepy. But what yeah, kind of like what's the, the benefit of that? Yeah. yeah. So what would the benefit of saying this is fake news and making it so front and center? Oh, you know, and I think I think that's yeah, I think those sites that do that, I think that's, you know, like I said, you go to the Babylon B. I mean, the onion, I agree, doesn't necessarily come out front and center, but they don't deny it either. But like, you know, like uh, you know, Saturday Night Live, you know, they 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 do come out and basically say that they're a parody and stuff like that. Um but the problem is, I think those type of things are so small. Uh, you know, the Babylon Bee and things like that, that, that they do come out and say it. It's, uh, it's just that we got so many uh, people who are purposely trying to manipulate by not, not saying things, right? That's, that's the scary part. It, when people get, the people who get confused over things like the onion, they have no chance with the deep fakes and stuff like that, you know, the yeah. better. And then there is the other question. What, I mean, how do we start separating fake news from satire? Because that's another, I think that's. Well, and, and satire, satire, I think is, um, it's, on the, it's on that spectrum of actual fake news, right? It is fake news, but there's also a little kernel of truth to it, right? That's, satire is kind of like a stereotype in, in the sense that um, what makes it funny is there's usually a kernel of truth to it, right? That's why Saturday Night Live is funny. That's why, you know, the jokes on The Daily Show are funny. But you have to be able to understand, you know, where the joke begins and where the joke ends and where the factual information is. So it, it involves, you know, being able to, you know, again, be, there, I always go back to what I tell my students, uh, my pre-service teachers, there's no substitute for good content knowledge. You know, part of, part of being a uh, understanding things like fake news is to be well-read, is to be up to date on what's going on in the world. Right. If you if you if you know what's going on in the world, you're less likely to be duped by things like satire. Right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. And I, and I think that's again. And once we go back in the case of our in the case of the students in this class, I think being able to do that kind of reading, I mean, you talk about the lateral reading, that kind of fact checking is necessary, um, especially because um, I'm, I mean, Sometimes and I make the comment when I it is about songs that sometimes I listen to songs I listened I, I used to listen when I was a child and I was learning the language and I listen to it and now I'm a professor and I'm like what on earth was I listening to at the time <laughs> like I just go and listen to the lyrics one more time and I'm like I was singing this yeah exactly like crap I mean I was saying this when I was twelve <laughs> like what is wrong with me but and I think that sometimes it happens with the news if you're not careful and I think uh, as teachers we have the responsibility to um, to really work on on being somehow being a source of fact checking, if you will. I think about the, I mean, thinking about the COVID situation that um, there was a point. My I mean, sometimes I would talk to my mom, and my mom would she's like, "Man, I'm getting all these messages from this, this, and that." And I mean, my mom at some point she decided she she wised up and she started calling me like every time she's like, "Hey, I heard this news report." Or somebody yeah. sent me this through on a chain, uh, this chain message on WhatsApp. 
Like, well, what do you know about that? I'm like, no, mom, that's just fake. I mean, that's just fake. And I told her, like, yeah, don't, because I mean, you got, they, I mean, that's a moment when we were bombarded by every piece of information and every piece of fake news about the vaccines and about the procedures and about the masks. And they're like, okay. And I think, uh, as in the, in the case of language teachers, we have, uh, we have this responsibility somehow, um, we have to wear this mantle of being gatekeepers. Mm-hmm. I mean, teachers in general, and even I'm thinking people like, even for example, in, in social studies, that, I mean, it's also the, that's also another field where yeah. you really have to um, see yourselves as gatekeepers. Um, and I think, I mean, I guess the language teachers, yeah, we are gatekeepers because we are the ones who can help our students really uh, sift through the language and get to the language that is confusing, the clickbaits. Clickbait is a very, it's a very tricky area where uh, if you don't have, strong command of the language you can easily fall prey to um believe in the news yeah well i'm glad you mentioned the pandemic too because i think that's the perfect example of the real life consequences of fake news i mean we have way more excess death in not just the united states but also around the world because so many people bought into fake news about the vaccines and things like that so i mean this isn't just a uh a theoretical discussion it has real world consequences too yeah because you see it right now like uh, like people listening to pop like mean um yeah. like right now there's the whole joe rogan thing yeah. going on in the united states i mean like uh, if we get this kind of podcast i mean we also got those uh youtube channels in spanish where um these people are like yeah i saw this on this youtube channel where this uh doctor or blah 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 was telling this and that you're like yeah but what's the uh science behind it right right what's the uh yeah, because even in that sense, even when you trivial, even in this whole world of fake news, this idea of, oh, I got to do my research. You're like, okay, what do you mean by doing your research? <laughs> like, uh, it's like, because even, even it's funny when people, do, I'm doing my research, like it means that like, you just did a Google search. Like, okay, even if you're going to do archival research, right? that entails, even if you're going to do archival research, you have to go through thousands of articles in order to do it, to, call, to actually call it research. <laughs> like, right. Even if it's not... Um, you know, uh, field work, uh, if you don't do archival work, you have to spend hours and weeks look sifting through articles and sifting through data to actually say, I did archival research. So it's something that we have to like stop trivializing that. And I think in the, cl- the classrooms are the first line of defense for, for that kind of conversations. In teacher education programs, we're definitely that part of that line of defense where we want to send our teachers out there with good tools, with the right tools, mm. in order to counter this, to counter the, to counter the misinformation, I always argue that the problem we have right now is not finding the information; it's curating it. It's actually being able right. to sift through it. Like mm. we, when we were in high school, people of my, our generation, the problem was access to information. But um, we've been through uh, the browser was invented thirty years ago, so it's kind of like the mm. origin. The thirty years ago, we started the World Wide Web. And ever yeah. since, accessing information has not been the problem. Has been the problem has been how do I tell the good stuff from the bad stuff? How do I sift it through? And I yeah. think conversations like this uh, about the nature of fake news and what it looks like and how to see it and how to read it and how to do the uh, fact checking, even even thinking in a language class, an exercise of fact checking and turning fact mm-hmm. checking into a reading comprehension strategy. Mm-hmm could be very helpful. Yeah, because I mean, language is at the center of all of this, right? You know, uh, because, you know, how people manipulate is they use language to manip- manipulate. I mean, so, they're, I mean, it's, in this sense, social studies and language, to me, are interconnected. It can't be just something that's done in social studies class. It's got to be done across the curriculum. <laughs> that's correct. Um, I don't know before we, because I mean, it's already, um, 915 for for you and everything. if there are any of the any questions from any one of the students who have any questions any comments uh before we start um wrapping this up um folks don't be shy let's give him a couple of again you can just type him in the chat or you can just turn on your microphones so don't be shy Uh, it's Friday morning, so probably they're yeah, really worn out. I hear you. <laughs> but with that, I just then I want to just wrap it up and um, 
express my gratitude to you, Wayne, for um, the time. I mean, I know that you, I mean, I know your schedule is all over the place as is everybody else's, but I do appreciate having you here. I appreciate um, the, uh, what you shared with us this morning, this morning for, for everybody, this afternoon for myself. Um, I think once the video is up, people will have a chance to listen to this and see all the great ideas that came out in the conversation that came out of the presentation. So definitely I want to thank you for, for your generosity because taking this time to meet with the students in my is, I mean, it's big, it's a testament of your generosity and your, and your kindness. So I appreciate that. Uh, no, no problem. Thanks for having me. My pleasure. And for everybody who will be, will be watching this eventually, just a reminder that this video is, will be part of the LSLP in session webinar series. So we invite you to watch this one and all the other amazing videos featuring um, scholars from Colombia and around the world. So with that, uh, once again, everybody, thank you so much and have a very, very great day.